Waiting, wait. Oh, it is working. All right, preview is working. Start streaming. Okay. All right, everybody. Hello, hello, and welcome to Teach Meet Three, which is called Get Checked Out. And I'm just talking to Phil about ten seconds of lead time until I can see my own face. Then I know, shit, we're live, as they say in the classics. <laughs> Alrighty, so welcome to Teach Me Three. Uh, this is a uh, little event. We uh, originally were going to do this in the flesh at Josh's school, uh, but uh, thanks to Matt Esterman who showed us that you didn't actually need to do it at a school during this time. That's kind of how we're doing it now. So what I'm going to do is completely forget how to do everything and stuff around. So Josh. Do you want to talk to us real briefly about this teach me thing that we're all on about? Uh, yeah, well, obviously it was going to be at my school, which is uh, it's in Melbourne Valley, uh, which is just outside of Melbourne for all the out of staters. Um, and uh, yeah, our school is embarking on a tech journey, sort of, sort of speak. And um, we thought it'd be great to have some tech people come in and you know actually use some of the stuff that we have there. And we have a lot of resources, which are fantastic. So. It was more of just, I guess, a um, a way to get get our own staff involved in in you know an outside perspective on tech as well, and, and obviously myself learning learning from everybody. But um, silver lining is that now we get people from all around Australia, so that, that's really helpful. And just looking at the topics, um, I'm really interested to kind of get mine out of the way, to be honest, and then just listen in. So I appreciate everyone being here, and um, I'm I'm sure lots of people from my school are tuning in and. Uh, from the network as well. Um, so yeah, so it's going to be pretty good. All right, beautiful. Let's get it started. Um, so I'll just take you through what a teach meet is. Um, I, I don't know if this is true of everyone else, but I've spent most of my life in, in webinars of late. Um, the only difference, I guess, is that we're all teachers. So the only difference between the people watching and the people in the room is quite literally that we're in uh, a live video call so that we can talk to each other and so that we don't get Zoom bombed or similar. Uh, these are the people that we've got lined up. Uh, we've had uh, only two dropouts from people, which is pretty good. Um, so if you haven't ever done a Teach Meet before, uh, it's as simple as filling in a Google form and then joining into the fun. So we've got 14 presenters. They're going to aim to be doing either two or eight minute presentations. Uh, traditionally, I think it's two or seven, but we found two or eight, you know, mathematically makes sense. Uh, this is where I do a welcome to country, acknowledgement of country, I guess, not welcome to country, that's a typo. But we are all on Aboriginal land and we rec recognise elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and rather than say the particular lands that I'm on now, since we're all online, let's keep it as open as possible and leave it at that. So what is a teach meet? Uh, this is run through Teach Meet Melbourne, but that's not especially important because we're all online. Presentations are short, equal weight given to all voices. So I imagine it won't happen tonight, but if anyone goes over eight minutes, then it's myself and Josh's job to sort of jump in and uh, cut them off, let's say, as adroitly as possible. And it's sector blind and inclusive. So uh, primary school, secondary school, um, we've rarely had an early childhood educator, but if anyone wants to, we'd love to have you. Uh, and obviously academics and anyone involved in education as well. So this is where I directly tell you what to do. Uh, basically, uh, if you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtag, hashtag TM3 or Teach Meet Mel, TM Mel. But obviously we're on YouTube and I, I can see you've already discovered the live chat, which is ideal. Uh, if you want, have a burning question, uh, you could tag my channel, which is at Mr. Colbert's Teaching, if you want to try that out. Uh, that sort of makes it more visible for me. And then I can ask those questions of the people following their presentations or at some point at the end, depending on how, how long we all take. Uh, but of course, the whole point is that this is democratic. So uh, feel free to respond to each other. Uh, what I would love for you to do now is just to sort of introduce yourself to one another. So if you're in the chat, um, so maybe say who you are and where you're currently uh, situated both geographically and maybe you know you, 
you're, you're in the Jimmy Jams or you're at home in bed or what are you doing at 8 o'clock on a Monday night. Uh, these are all the people that you should be following if you're not. Uh, at this point, the trick of being on YouTube is if you go to the description box, uh, you can see all the details of these people there. You can even see what they're presenting on and you can see a whole bunch of resources that will come up as they begin. So I don't want to keep talking, uh, but likewise, I won't show this on the screen for too long. I might pause momentarily, but also the all of this information is in the description of this video. So you can sort of keep track of who is where and where you're up to. And if you really like an idea, obviously comment in the chat or spend some time uh, connecting out with these people on Twitter or wherever you can find them online because uh, there's a lot of different ways that we can all connect with one another. All right, so this is a blank slide, which means our first presentation is from Zaina. So Zaina, if you want to jump on, that would be fine. The app is telling me my microphone is noisy, which is the idea, so that's all good. And Zaina, if you're ready, feel free to jump on. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Let's Get Teched Up Teach Me 3. I would do anything to be in Melbourne right now. So I think I'm joining you in this spirit of being together whilst being apart. If we're not connected on Twitter yet, you can find me at Zena Chalish. Follow through. I'll be doing a live chat straight after my presentation, answering all your questions. I'm just putting it out there. Sticking to time limits is not my thing. I'm trying so hard here. I will try to honour the process of being short and sharp. Um, I will keep it to Josh and to Steve too throw something virtual at me to let me know if I'm going over time. So I'm going to stop talking for a second. I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. So to get us started, I would love for you to warm up your tweeting fingers by sharing with us somewhere in the world that you would love to be traveling right now. Where would you go and why? Share it out, tag a friend, tweet using TeachMe3 and Aussie Ed. My topic tonight is going to be about immersive technology. Essentially, immersive technology is good for making the scene unseen. Immersive technology has disrupted the way we play, work, learn, heal, and even teach. XR is an emerging umbrella term for all the immersive technologies. These technologies extend the reality we experience by either blending the virtual and real worlds or by creating a fully immersive experience. Students need advanced skills to succeed in the globalized knowledge-based digital world. XR technology is now more affordable and accessible than ever before. So it's on us to leverage it. So why XR in education? If I had a whole day, I would walk you through my workshop. If I had an hour, I would give you a short version of my workshop. I've only got seven minutes left, I think. So today I'm gonna to focus on promoting empathy and compassion for people and places, providing opportunities for students to communicate, collaborate, create, and also to develop STEM-related future work skills. XR allows us to take students to space, to the Great Barrier Reef, and to walk in the shoes of a refugee in Syria. Tinkering with XR. The best way to facilitate immersive learning is by providing students with time to play, explore, discover, and experiment with their peers. Here are some accessible and affordable entry level tools and platforms we have used to introduce XR to students in primary across a range of learning areas. We then provide context and help students use the tools to communicate their learning, giving attention to student agency and creativity. The focus is always on quality pedagogy, not the technology. XR won't rescue poor teaching practice or be a substitute for lived experiences. In these challenging times of COVID-19, XR can provide excellent opportunities for students to explore and learn about places from the comfort of their own homes or schools. But honestly, if there's a chance to take your students on an excursion out of a place or an event, book the bus, complete that risk assessment and just go for it. Once students develop sound skills in using, creating and coding with the various XR tools, we can level up the complexity of learning by launching things like the Future City Design Challenge. We remix the characters from the Stanford City X project to develop our own Future City Design Challenge characters who were profiled using the factual information from the Global Goals resources. These characters owned authentic problems from all parts of the world. 
As designers of learning, we need to create opportunities for students to engage with real world problems and to apply their solutions or ideas in practice. Design thinking is a great way to spark empathy and seek problems worth solving. It's also a collaborative approach to problem solving that develops future STEM work skills. We use the STEM for design thinking framework to guide our projects and in this example, our future city design challenge. We immerse students in a range of experiences to gather ideas about which problems they wanted to help solve using tech. They listen to interviews, watch documentaries, read diaries and unpacked real data. Empathy is the foundation of human-centred design. The problems we're usually trying to solve are rarely our own. They're those of particular users, and in this case, for our challenge, were owned by characters. We can build empathy for our users by learning their values in different ways. Designers usually engage with their users to understand their needs and gain insights about their lives. However, situations sometimes are too remote, dangerous, or too far out for our students to fully immerse themselves. So we can use multimodal resources and now XR to walk a mile in their shoes. Chris Milk, the virtual reality filmmaker, believes virtual reality is the ultimate empathy machine. He believes these experiences are more than documentaries. They're opportunities to walk a mile in someone's shoes. Clouds Over Sidra is the first ever short film in VR for the United Nations to generate greater empathy and new perspectives on people living in conditions of great vulnerability. It has powerful capacity to allow anyone on a global scale to experience life within a refugee camp. For our students, it has the ability for them to see, think and feel through the eyes of their character, drawing comparisons between their own lives and that of a child living in a refugee camp. Gathered with other research, students follow the design thinking process to define problem statements, brainstorm solutions and develop a prototype solution to solve one of the many authentic problems that were owned by the characters in the future design challenge. As you can see, some students use robotics and physical structures to bring their ideas to life. Others use VR to allow for full immersion of their prototype. Another great experience is the PricewaterCooper Global Goals Dome, which shows short VR videos about climate change and environmental issues that we also include as part of the Future Design Challenge. Students explore a range of multimodal resources focusing on the use of imagery, colour, tone and music to evoke empathy during these experiences. Some students were inspired to create their own coral reef endangered special museum and floating garbage game to showcase their learning and highlight the need for humans to take action. Students viewed a range of design projects in AR and VR. Some even mimic the PricewaterCooper Dome to add more to the experience and evoke empathy from other students about the endangered animal species. These are just two quick examples shared in the short time I have with you tonight. I'm pretty sure Steve is throwing at something at me virtually. <laughs> to get started with AR for free, check out some of these from my good friends at Merge VR, where you can print your own Merge Cube and download apps to a range of key learning strategies. Now, your call to action is to learn by playing different XR technologies, seek inspiration from outside the classroom, connect with people, industry experts and problem owners, think like a designer, don't wait, just start. Thanks for joining me tonight. I hope you learned a little bit about what XR is and that you will take a chance and have a go at trying something different. Um, stay tuned for more presentations coming right up and if we haven't connected yet, take a photo of my details and let's chat. Thank you so much and have a good night. Beautiful work, and well under time. You've got a minute and a half left. No way. <laughs> Easy done. So was that seven minutes? Yeah. Woo. Oh, we give you eight, you know, we're generous around here. Personal best. Happy to take any questions from the audience? Yeah, for sure. All right, I'll throw, throw some to you as they come through. Uh, next up, we've got Michelle Dennis about remote design thinking tools. And uh, I'm just going to personally spend my time Googling XR and looking into those cool things that I didn't even know were a thing. So, Michelle, if you want to come off mute and show off your fancy background, we're ready when you are. <laughs>
Thank you. You have to be careful with the background when there's a little one wandering around. There's a door behind me and I'm going to be in perpetual fear for the next few moments, hoping that she doesn't burst in. Um, Zoom bombing is a thing, but um, there are other dangers in the online learning environment as well. So today I would like to talk to everyone about design thinking and how you can do it in the remote learning environment. A lot of us had to adjust our learning styles to fit in with this new way of thinking and our um, new way of dealing with students. And design thinking for me, um, it's really funny coming after Zena, who's also been doing design thinking. For me, it's such an authentic way to get students to work. Um, on my slide, I've got a link to an article that um, is on LinkedIn that includes links to all the things I talk about. Um, and that's my Twitter handle, Michelle Dennis. I'd love to chat if anyone has any questions. Um, very happy to answer them. So design thinking for me, the reason I love doing it with students is that it's really focused on the kind of skills they're gonna need in the modern workplace. So when we look at people who work online now, they need to be able to collaborate, they need to be able to be creative, they need to solve problems, they need to be able to manage complex problems and they need to be, the, they need to be in control. So, I think that design thinking is one of the greatest ways you can introduce these skills to students in a way which is also very rich from an academic point of view. So the challenge I've had moving this design thinking online is how can we facilitate it in a remote environment and how can we scaffold and document it? Because it is a complex process sometimes and I wanna make sure that my students are learning how to go about it so that it gets easier and easier every time they do the design thinking process. To help with that, within as a school, we've created our own design thinking structure. We looked at the one from Stanford and we love it, but we found that the Stanford model couldn't go down low enough. We wanted to be able to use it really easily down in our primary school all the way up to year nine. So we took the core steps and the core ideas behind user-oriented design thinking. And we tried to encapsulate those in terms that we thought you could understand in ELC. From understanding the problem, identifying what you're going to solve, ideating about lots of different possible solutions, creating your final solution, and then finally taking it outside the classroom and sharing not just your solution, but the thinking behind it, making sure that our students were able to express their learning. To document the process in an online environment, I'm using the same techniques I did in the classroom. I've used both Adobe Spark Page and Microsoft Sway. They're both very easy to use online websites. Um, Spark also has an app that works on the iPads and it allows students to really quickly add some photos and some text. And I ask them to, at the end of every stage or every day, go through a short reflective process where they identify what they did, so what, so why was it important? And then they plan what's gonna happen next, now what? So what, so what, now what? If you make reflective process too wordy, kids aren't gonna to wanna to do it, so I try to keep it simple. So those are my two tools that teams could use to keep those diaries. And since they're websites, I could see it as it was being developed. In the classroom, when I'm in the understanding stage, I'm often trying to give students that ramp up and that knowledge they're gonna to need to solve the problem. So I usually give them challenges that they have to solve. So for example, I might give them, um, when I was doing a video game unit, I gave them different scratch challenges with different problems to solve. A teacher would check that they'd completed them and then sign off to say they could move on to the next challenge. In the online learning environment, I moved towards using Microsoft OneNote for this. We called them exit tickets just to make it more uh, students more comfortable with the process. And the teacher, again, could see as they were doing it and sign off at the end to say, yes, they had achieved it. If you haven't seen Grok Learning yet and your design product is something that requires a bit of coding, I'm loving their live classroom. Wasn't there the last time I used Grok, it's a fairly new addition. And it allows you to see live what students are doing in that um, learning environment. So when you're giving them those skills in app development, 
Python, whatever, um, you can see what they're doing in that Grok learning environment. And that's free at the moment until the 1st of July because of COVID. Thank you, Grok. At the understand stage, I often use a lot of post-it notes. I think it's really useful for students to start thinking about what a good product would look like, a good solution. Um, so I get them to idea, uh, to plan together using post-it notes, what, what should you see in a good video game? Um, Padlet works quite well for this. So Padlet is a website where you can get the students to come and just press plus to add what they call cards underneath each column. So in this example, how it looks, you press plus and they can add their own versions of what a good video game should look like. How should you control a good video game? How would you learn it? How would you progress or win? And when they've come up with that, they've basically come up with the criteria you can judge their products with. When I get to the identification stage, students need to start thinking about what a good problem is to solve. And I use a website called iCompass for that. It's something called the Innovators Compass, and it allows you to brainstorm from past, to, uh, so from present to future, and from big pictures to small um, to details. So that allows students to really think about all the 360 degree angles of a problem and consider it really deeply when they're trying to find what they want, what problem they want to solve. Problem finding is a skill and it's something students really need to um, develop and practice at. Really great website, highly recommended. I use it with staff as well. Ideation is probably my favorite uh, stage of the process because it's when there's the most excitement and when everything's up in flux, anything is possible. Um, dot storming. Uh, so you can see I use a pile of post-it notes using a technique called crazy eights. Um, in the online learning environment, I've started using dot storming. Uh, students can add their ideas and then at the end, they can have three votes for the three ideas that they like the best. And I like the name is completely taken away. Um, so the ego comes out of it. It becomes about the idea and not the person who suggested it. So that's dot storming. You don't need the kids to have an account to join in. Um, when they're creating, the biggest problem students have is working out who's doing what when. So I use in the real classroom uh, a Kanban board, which is a Japanese technique where there's three columns, to do, doing and done. And they use post-it notes to say whether a task is in which one of those columns and it shows when something's being worked on by another team member. So they don't have to always, um, so you don't have two kids working on the same thing or um, something left behind. A virtual version of that is Trello. So that's trello.com that allows you to really, um, you can invite a whole lot of different kids into it and they can collaborate on their plan. Uh, Microsoft Teams has one built in called Microsoft Planner that is also very, very good. The share stage is when the students get the most excited because that's when they take their ideas and they share it with the public. So often we'll have an expo where family and other students can come and test their designs and vote on what they think is the people's choice for the most innovative product. Flipgrid has been really good there. And again, that's something Zena said as well. Um, Flipgrid is amazing because it doesn't take lengthy video editing skills. The kids can record directly into the website and upload it. Um, and it's very, very easy to use. There is also an app for it. So um, you can either use it in the website or on an app. It works on basically any device. And I really, really love it. So hopefully I've given you a few skills there to help you use design thinking, not just in a remote environment, but a lot of those will also work in the um, real classroom as well. I say real classroom, our remote classrooms are real classrooms. I shouldn't down speak it. Um, I'm Michelle Dennis on Twitter, if you want to reach out or have any questions. Um, and that's the article where I've listed all of those websites, just in case I was talking way too fast knowing that I had a time limit um, and you didn't get it down. So I'd love to know if anyone has any questions. All right, beautiful. I will throw to you after Mark. Uh, there was one, but it, it doesn't make sense to me. So we'll wait until there's one that does. <laughs> <laughs> about 40 hours uh, doesn't make sense to me, but 
I'll give you a second to uh, check it as we wait. Um, we've got one for Zaina. Uh, the question is, is there any concern with VR being used by primary students in regards to developmental age, which is outside my area? So Zaina, any thoughts on that? Yeah, look, there is a lot of research out there. And I think the best advice is to always follow the guidelines that are provided with the different um, devices. For us, um, it's been a low entry process for us. We've tinkered with AR, then we've tinkered with VR. Um, we haven't launched into the full immersion handset walking around the room just yet, mainly because it's expensive. Um, and secondly, we're not sure about the guidelines for students under 12. So for us, we've actually started playing with XR in primary. However, we are looking at investing in those devices for the senior years. But I've heard conflicting, look, I've seen research from both sides, but I think the biggest thing to do is to follow the guidelines that at this stage, students under the age of 12 should not be on a virtual reality device, a standard device, I believe, for more than 12 to 15 minutes. But honestly, when you have a class of 30 students, who has time to have a child on for more than 10 or 15 minutes? I think for us, the biggest part is for our students to experience VR, to know about VR and XR. And a lot of our students do use it for edutainment when they go overseas, when they go away. So it's kind of a blurred line there. But for us at school, our focus is to shift our students to be creators of XR rather than just consumers. Beautiful. Well said. All right, now we're going to throw to Mark Yeats, whose presentation is simply entitled Just Getting Dressed, which I know for me personally has been a struggle most days. Uh, <laughs> PJs and trackies for most of that. So, Mark, over to you. All right, thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, I uh, am a secondary educator, and I'd love to start out tonight by just sort of saying uh, congratulations to everybody. I think at the moment we're doing an amazing job as educators. Uh, not only uh, in Australia but around the world and uh, we need to give ourselves a pat on the back and uh, take a bit of breath because uh, we're doing a good job. Um, and look, following those two ladies is, uh, is, is a big act to, uh, to big, big, big one to follow. So I'm looking forward to getting on and sharing my screen with you. I've got a few little, my screen is not going to work. Let me try that again. Are we up there now? Beautiful. And I yeah. thought I'd have a little joke first up because my speakers before me were so good. Um, I'd start by using a little bit of tech and stealing it from them. Um, up the top there, you'll notice that uh, I'm a design teacher and have been for 20 odd years and uh, I'm loving that little station. So I stole that out of the last uh, one to start mine off tonight. But I think often we um, spend a lot of time thinking about the technology and, uh, and 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 I, I know I do. I've, I've done VR. I've um, worked in uh, digital education probably for fifteen to twenty years now. I started teaching um, uh, Autodesk many many years ago when we had to leave our computers for three days to render an object, and uh, it's been a long journey. And I think there are a few things that have really stuck out to me, and I'd love to share a few of those with you tonight. And I guess. Um, this concept of just getting dressed, and I think um, we we spend a lot of time on the bells and whistles, but we don't often think about the basics of what kids know and then build upon that. And um, I've got this little analogy that I use for all my kids, and I'd love to share it with you if that's okay. So the, the concept of just getting dressed is that we get out of bed in the morning and we put on clothes. And we have a series of choices and I, I would give them a little link like this one and I'd get them to open it up and I'd go through it and I'd get the, depending on what age it is, I'd get them to pick out and then I'll get them to get a B-Bot and uh, set up a code on the floor maybe in, in 10 by 10 squares and do a um, basic uh, coding pr uh, problem or write the problem first and then solve the problem. And I think sometimes we go out of our way to actually do this, these things for the kids. And one of the things I'm getting to as I get down my years of education is that I often wonder if getting the kids to actually make up the 10 by 10 squares by using a projector and using some of the old school tech that we had uh, many, many moons ago to project up onto a board and put a piece of paper up there and draw around the outside of a jacket and a pair of socks and a pair of undies and a shirt 
and then take those things, take them down onto the ground and then colour those things in and then place them and then laminate them and then put the 10 by 10 squares out on the ground is actually the why behind what we do. And Simon Sinek, you can see him here on my screen, um, has always been a big man looking at uh, a concept of why. And if you if well, if you know me, I, I spend a lot of my time in the why zone trying to justify why I do what I do when I rock up to school. And I guess the concept of then getting the kids to write down what that's all about and and, uh, and have a think about why they actually put what clothes they put on this morning on. And we don't actually take the time often to slow down and think about those smaller things and how critical they are to our everyday life. If we walked out without our shirt on and went to school, would it change our life? Well, I'm thinking it probably would, okay? Um, and there's critical understandings in these things that, again, um, I've mapped out there on the screen in front of you. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but it's, for me it's this concept of metacognition where we are looking at thinking about the thinking that we do in everyday life and using those things, uh, allowing kids to use the technology to really think about whether we should be changing some of those things or whether we should be just accepting them uh, and thinking about the whys behind what we do and why we do it. Um, challenging them with this little man over on the right-hand side here who's um, learning to walk, a bit different to the way we learn to walk in Australia, okay? And and and, and what is that about? And I, I know that um, Zena and, uh, and some of the speakers tonight have, have mentioned things like empathy and resilience um, computational thinking hasn't been mentioned tonight, so I'll I'll be the first one on that bandwagon. And that's the concept of that we do everything. Humans do everything in ordered pattern, and we we tend to like order. And this wonderful uh, situation we're in at the moment has put us in a position where our order has been somewhat challenged. And uh, I think that sometimes puts us in a headspace where we struggle. Okay, and learning to deal with that. Uh, is all about how we challenge the kids with the knowledge they already know. Okay, so my my challenge to you guys is that when we when we walk into a classroom, rather than setting Okay. Anyone anyone know what just happened? Alrighty. Uh what's going on, people? Any thoughts? I think we might have lost Mark, maybe. Yeah, tech gods, tech gods can't let us have this, you know. There's gotta be something. Does anyone is anyone good with computers here? <laughs> <laughs> no ticket, no job, no problem, guys. Sorry, log a ticket. <laughs> Try turning it on again and off again. <laughs> Wait, put it, put Mark in rice. Put Mark in rice. <laughs> all righty. Well, I don't know. Mark's gone. I can still see his shared screen, but that's all I've got. Uh, so, is there any questions for Mark that we can answer on Mark's behalf? <laughs> I just put in the chat, um, he's, winning, he's winning EdTech bingo already. Go on. Go EdTech bingo? Yeah, he was like, all right, has anyone talked about computing yet? No, has anyone? No, all right, okay, I'll be the first to do it. Hey, <laughs> I, I took the winner. I said we want to shift our students from consumers to create it. Boom. Beautiful. I think yeah. Michelle had future focused. Boom. <laughs> He's from Queensland. They probably quarantined him. They won't let in anyone else in or out. Yeah. Hey, Stephen, you might you might try kicking him, and maybe it'll take the screen off. All right, let's do that. Let's. I've always wanted to kick Mark, so this is very good. <laughs> Mark, want to share those cool links on YouTube? Though, have we got access to that document? Yeah, yeah. So they're down in the um in the description currently. Okay. Cool. Cool. That's great. Um, all right, who wants who wants to kick him for me? I know someone does. Kick him? Yeah, we've got to kick him out because he's hogging the screen. It's stuck on his frozen um, screen. 
I really did it. I, I, had it. I was gonna, hovering. Like, I was hovering. Um, I'm just going to bear witness that Josh did that, Mark, if you're watching this later. <laughs> it was out of love. It was out of love. <laughs> All right, Karen, if you want to jump in, um, you know, you've, Mark's just giving you a whole lot more time if you want to go from there. Sure, I don't, I don't need extra time, but that's okay. <laughs> um let me i didn't test this before so i'm just going to select the window oops why won't it let me allow it oh, firefox i'm gonna to have to jump out and use a different browser because right. firefox apparently won't let me share my screen oh okay so, well wow. I'll be here um, scrolling through the uh, YouTube comments, which say sound dropped out, Mark dropped out, which is <laughs> Correct. a very good question. I can confirm that the answer to that is yes. Uh, and scanning up, what else have we got? So Russell Can said, Dana, immersive is over 12 in New South Wales DOE. You have to be over 12? I think so, yeah. Do you know what, Steve? I used to really hold all these laws so um so tightly, but the Zoom boom has sort of showed me that rules are there to be broken when wanted and needed. So better to yeah. seek um, forgiveness and permission sometimes. But I just don't have that expensive headset to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that we had a we had an incursion for um for VR in space, and where I'm in primary, and they had um like the kids have to be sitting down and there wasn't head straps. So they have to actually hold it yep. in their hand because, um, you know, they just get sick or whatever. So you can see the kids taking it off every couple of seconds. Cause you can see them just like getting so like, like they're going to the moon and back to thing. And it's like, I guess that particular one, like the graphics weren't like super great. So you could see it being a little choppy. And even I put it on, I was like getting a little dizzy. So it was good that they let them put it on the floor and take a break. Um, but I can imagine that for anyone, even adult or, or kid, it would take a lot of getting used to. And that's especially with the low quality, um, which I feel like is quite affordable and accessible. We had the food on a truck VR van come, and after six minutes, the kids just had enough with the graphics and all of that. So there's a lot to um, there's a lot to develop in this area, but um, I think we're we're making a start. So we're gonna get better eventually. We've been yeah. using the Oculus Rift and um, I have the opposite problem. I have to kick them out. So <laughs> I had one student who was um, painting in Google Tilt Brush oh, and I had to be like, no, nah, you've been in there long enough. It's time to enter the real world again. Um, Do you have like a booth? Uh, I use, um, we have a little TV studio. So I use that TV space. Um, that, nice. it's fan that sounds far fancier um, than <laughs> it probably should be um but yeah so um to be honest uh i also have it at home at the moment in my living room and that's oh, my cutting out go get off <laughs> uh, you know what beat saber it's how you can you know do your exercise in iso um keeping you know me active totally i love it I, I, well, as soon as the flights are open i'm coming to melbourne just to play with your vr stuff oh man you're welcome anytime you'd have Can't so wait. much fun I'm addicted. Not, yeah. <laughs> but now someone's going to ask me about screen time addiction with VR, Michelle. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's easy. Um, Karen, do you want to test it out? Let's see. Which browser have we got rolling at the moment? Oh, oh, oh. All right, let's keep picking on Zaina then, I guess. <laughs> okay, what would you like to know? <laughs> this, is, this is where my stand-up career comes in, you know, and I need my tight three minutes to it fill just, the gap. Jory, just dropped out again. <laughs> oh. I'm on standby if you need me. Hi, Harvey. Hello. How are you doing, Michael? I've got a physics joke. Uh, how can Go you on. tell the difference between a male ant and a female ant? You throw the ant into water. The boy, if it floats, it's a boy ant. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's terrible, Michael. That's a 
<laughs> Exiled from the realm as as your Twitter Twitter profile. Oh, exactly. <laughs> project. That's why nobody invites Kiwis to peace meets in Australia. <laughs> I, mean, I, sh I, should, I shouldn't have made that tech joke, should I? I ended up crashing, <laughs> crashing my own computer. Oh, Mark, you're back. I the, am, the mate. YouTube chanting, we want Mark. Do you want to give it another go? Uh, mate, I'll give it a crack. How did I, what, what stage did I drop out? That's the next thing I need. You ended up uh, yeah, Give me uh, two seconds. On, what you an oh. honest answer. Come on. I was in the middle of your tweet of a tweet, Mark. I need to finish it off. <laughs> All right, we've got screen. We've got screen. Okay. Well, there's me. Good to yeah. see me. Do you, want me, do you want me to start again or where did I, where did I get to? The bottom of your first page. Oh, okay, cool. So I did get through most of it. All right, no worries. Look, I guess uh, I, in finishing off, I, I, I don't know where I'm at with time. Sorry, I do apologise about crashing my own machine. Um, I'm try, I was trying to do some virtual reality in, uh, in this space, which is obviously not worth <laughs> trying. Um, so I won't do that again. Zena, there's a learning for both of us. All right. So uh, the, really the last slide that I have is this one for you. Everything that exists in your life does so because two things, something you did or something you didn't do. And I think that those two really basic concepts are something that we could spend a lot more time thinking about, uh, looking at how our kids make their choices, how they go about their learning, uh, and you'll notice that a lot of my focus as I get older, particularly um, those guys who've been with me on Twitter for many years now, you, has become about what they need rather than what I bring to the classroom. And I think um, moving into a, into an age where uh, the, the technologies are just so vast, uh, and like I said, I've been in this technology game for a long time and I struggle to get my head around some of the stuff these kids are doing today. Um, I had one of my year seven students doing a tour creator today and came to me with 19 spheres and wanted to ask me if he could connect them with video. And I went, I have absolutely no idea. And that's where I'd like to end is and I don't have all the answers. Um, and I don't uh, pretend for a minute to think that as an educator, um, I don't have things to learn. So look, like, like all my other uh, colleagues on here, we're doing the best we can one day at a time. And you'll notice I've stolen a whole heap of things off the slides down below here using a little tool that I get my kids to use all the time called the snipping tool. And it's one of the most powerful tools you've got. And again, there's another little piece of technology that is often overlooked. Anyway, that's me for tonight um, and feel free to look me up on Twitter and uh, I'd love to have a conversation with any educator in Australia or overseas. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, are Stephen, you are you muted, mate? You're muted, Stephen. Steve's, Steve's muted. Yeah. <laughs> so, surely look. that's got to be on the bingo, doesn't it? Got Somebody's got to have that on the bingo. Oh, that's, but that'd be brilliant, wouldn't it? Or have we lost him? I looked, maybe his mute, maybe his mic's not actually working. Uh -huh. Have we lost you, Steve? Nod once for yes. Yeah, it looks like it's dead. Um, that's all right. Well, we can move on to the next one while he sorts that out, um, just for safer time. So, Karen, I think you're up next, aren't you? you can give it another go. Yeah, hopefully it works this time. Uh, I'm not an expert in tech, which, With tech, is, we can pretty, which is pretty <laughs> obvious. Um, I know what I know how to do, but that's about it. So let me try this again. And see. So I'm just going to talk about um, just some of the things that we're doing. Is that working? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. yep, yep. yep. 
Okay, cool. Um, so the title said remote learning, but we use this all, all of the time. So um, these are just some tools that we use all of the time. The other thing is my Twitter is KCASW1. Um, the order of the letters was just mixed up in the notes. Um, so I'm just going to quickly share how we use iTunes U, Seesaw, and we've just started using Flipgrid, but a couple of other people have spoken about that anyway. Um, so we use iTunes U. I suppose it's like our LMS. Um, we have courses for all of our year levels. We have curriculum courses, these ones here, which house all of our curriculum documents, um, our unit overviews, teaching sequence, assessment um, documents. Uh, and then each year level will have um, some of their own, depending on how they, they work. So you'll see down here we had subject um, courses for term one and obviously for the last five weeks in Queensland we have had um, some home learning home program courses so our students will access their resources for lessons um, from those courses and you can see that we have the tabs and then we order and sequence the lessons this is where they'll open up um, if we've got a task for them to complete in a keynote uh, or however they're completing the task and whatever documents they'll need, they access from there. Here's just an example of um, the curriculum documents. So as I said, these are like our point of truth, I suppose, for every year level um, for what we're doing with our teaching and learning. Then Seesaw. So um iTunes U and Seesaw are our two main digital platforms that we use. We are an Apple Distinguished School, which is probably one of the reasons we do use iTunes U. Um, but Seesaw, and I know many people know about Seesaw um, and everyone that uses it, you know, think sees the value and the worth in it, especially during the last five weeks. We've really noticed the um, partnership between school and home. Parents can access all of their students' learning um, and see the work that they're submitting um, so that they have that connection and it, it's it's daily, the parents can see. So we share at the moment, we've been sharing classes just in case any of us get sick. Um, somebody else can always access our Seesaw class for us. Um, and then we have the students <clears throat> listed in each of those classes. Within Seesaw itself, the organisation is really handy and the way you can do it, you can set activities. So here we've got all of our activity libraries, we can assign those. And <clears throat> once we've done that, we can then look at the view of who's replied or responded to that activity. So it's really easy at a glance to see which students have or haven't completed the task. And this is just here, you can schedule activities as well. Um, so you don't have to be on there, <coughs> excuse me, you know, all of the time, you can set it up and it's ready to go. You can put work into folders as well. There is skills, which um, I haven't really started using yet, but I know other people at school. So within your activity, you can assign a skill and you can do marking criteria as well. <coughs> the other great thing about Seesaw is feedback. So you can provide written feedback. You can provide an audio comment. You can um, annotate and mark on students' work. You can add stickers and stamps to their work, which is what they've really liked for the last few weeks as well. And then the other one, just very quickly, Flipgrid. We've really only just started using this, um, this term. I started it last term. I did a global kindness connection with a class in Virginia. Um, and so that was a really good way for the students to, co to connect. They could make um, videos and then students could reply to those little videos with each other. And then this is just something we've started this term um, with our students whilst they've been at home. And I know that our year five classes have actually started using Flipgrid for reciprocal reading. Um, obviously, you know, <clears throat> when you're in school, that would be done in a very different way. But Flipgrid's really good for providing students with a voice um, and able to respond to other students' um, tasks as well, which is really good with reciprocal reading because they obviously build on each other's comments. So that was the end of that. So I'll just quickly go back 
um, just to the my details there and then I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice work. Um, I was definitely here the whole time and I'm pretty pretty confident it was Mark who kicked me out actually just to make it even after I kicked him out or Josh did, let's say. Um, I really like that idea. I think Flipgrid is one of the things that's a really good, neat transition from remote to back to face to face because it's sort of a little bit video, it's a little bit face to face, can be done at home, can be done wherever it, wherever you are. So I'll, I'll be pitching that to my own colleagues this Thursday. Uh, Matt, good to see your face. Good to see you guys. I'm up. And yeah. I, I've got three minutes, so I'm going to pretty much rant for three minutes really quickly. And if there's any questions, you might have to ask me afterwards. So I just want to talk about three things. Hi, everyone. Matt from Perth. Welcome. Wherever you are, I'm here. You're out there. Um, Three things I want to talk about. Why before what? I want to talk about using the best tech available for the situation. And I also want to, my number, my third point is don't blame the tool, blame the tool using the tool. I want to talk through that in a moment. So first up is the why. And, and it's pretty much uh, what Mark was saying before. Technology exists to solve problems. And, and it doesn't always feel like that, but that's what it's for. That's the truth. It's to solve a problem. If you can't answer the why, uh, the what's going to cause grief. If technology is not solving a problem, it's creating problems, it's that shiny piece of tech that someone gave you and then went, why are you not using that shiny piece of tech that kind of rolls around and does stuff? Um, start with the why, figure out that why and you'll find the what easy to answer. It's probably going to cost you a lot less in time, in frustration, uh, in money. Next up, use the best available technology for the situation. So for me, Sometimes the best tech is paper and a pencil. I stole this off a kid this morning. It's good. Piece, it's a good pencil. Use technology because it's great. Um, I use tech for like paper and pencil for designing. Uh, students might eventually end up uploading a digital image, but the first part is always paper and pencil, and that's intentionally because it's the best technology I can use for that situation. I've had students try use. In the past, things like Microsoft Paint to draw pictures of pizzas and it doesn't look like a pizza. Um, explore this further by looking into that SAMA model. I know someone's going to talk about SAMA later on, but if we're not using tech for uh, significant modification and reimagination of our tasks, then we're, we're using technology to create more problems than it's going to solve. And finally, now this one, I know it sounds a little bit facetious, it sounds a little bit frivolous, but I got his shirt when I left my last job and on the back it says I work with tools and it's a Makita shirt. Whenever I wear it to work, everyone kind of gets really offended. I'm not really sure why because it's on the back of my shirt. But it made me think about this. Don't blame the tool, blame the tool using the tool. And I'm not saying our kids are tools, but sometimes technology will be used the wrong way. Um, it could be a teacher, it could be a student. And sometimes we say, why are we letting our kids get this technology and doing the wrong things? Because they mess around, they get off task, they do, they do silly things, those naughty little children. Um, have you seen John Wick 2 or John Wick 3? If you've seen John Wick 2 and you still use pencils, then you should be ashamed of yourself. If you've seen John Wick 3 and you still use books, see above. Because John Wick does some stuff with pencils and books that shouldn't be done with pencils and books. But we never ban those things because... Their pencils and books. Um, technology has the potential to be misused. Any technology, all technology. Uh, it's not the tool, it's the person who uses the tool in the wrong way. That's the problem. And that's what we need to manage. Don't throw the technology out because people do the wrong thing with technology. I think that's probably my time. Thanks for the opportunity. Hang in there, stay safe. If you've got any questions, I'm on Twitter or you can ask me somewhere and I'll be here. <laughs> in, in, in imitable style matt beautifully <laughs> now i've got to go watch some films as well oh i knew my my lack oh matt i can't hear you what oh, i turned it off sorry man i muted myself because i was i was laughing at my own material because i <laughs> <laughs> my wife tells me to stop trying to be funny because you're never funny and i'm like i think i'm pretty good but you know whatever <laughs> Well, I've just heard, finished watching a comedian say that 
comedy over Zoom doesn't work, but this is the funniest I've been, talking to no one to an empty room. Um, <laughs> Nicola, you're up there. Uh, talking about ACA's resources, which might be something of a change of, uh, change of tone, perhaps, but over to you. Thank you, everybody. Um, hi, I hope you can all give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay. I'm now worried that I might be the tool using the tool, but um, having supervised home learning for a few weeks and watching my kids make mind maps and word documents, um, I can't agree more with you. I've just been throwing them pens and papers and saying, do this. Um, so welcome everyone. I'm not gonna take up too much time. I'm Nicola, I'm from the Australian Computing Academy, which is a sister company with Grok, who uh, Michelle mentioned very kindly in her speech. So Grok Learning and Australian Computing Ac Academy together develop resources for teachers and schools. Uh, we focus really on the teacher outreach and the learning. Um, and I just wanted to pop in tonight and show off some of what we've been doing because since early March, we've been crazy running around making things and doing things and uh, we're just starting to catch our breath. And I think out of it, we've learnt uh, on top of everything else, we've got to be flexible. So I'm reeling a little bit tonight with the news that it looks like New South Wales schools are going to be back on the 25th of May. So here we go again, what's the next pivot? Um, with that in mind, I just wanted to chat through some of what we've been making at the ACA. Uh, it's all free, um, ready for teachers and students to use. And Grok Learning, our sister company, as part of their COVID response, have made all of their courses and competitions, which are usually subscription-based, free out till the end of term two. So if you were ever interested in having a look, um, one of the cool things they do is a web design competition for high school students, which you'd normally have to pay for. It's a five week comp that kicked off this week. So you can do it all within the free period if that's of interest to you. Uh, so let's, I'm gonna share my screen and just zoom you through a couple of screens and show you what we've been working on. And I'm going to start on the ACA website. Um, if you haven't visited before, aca.edu.au. And the place I spend most of my time is on this resources page. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff on there. We try and make it not as overwhelming, but you can scroll through. The best thing to do is filter. And the first filter I'll show you is something called DT at Home. Um, for a company or an organization that makes online learning, probably one of the strangest things we did early was decide to stop making more tech-based solutions to homeschooling and remote learning. So we dropped everything for a couple of weeks and made uh, 26 different sort of hour-long activities for primary and high school kids, which are all just simple PDFs. So trying to find tech for kids that don't have computers and Wi-Fi. Uh, they're as simple as for lower primary, um, I'm looking through the Wombat, Wombot Carrot Hunt's pretty cute. Um, messy Draws, our simplest one. So it's literally uh, an activity and data representation and sorting where you get kids to go and look through a drawer and group things and collect things and look at things like, what if we group them by color? What if we group them by size? What can we learn? Uh, it's all linked back to the Australian Curriculum for Digital Technologies. And it goes right up to high school. So this one here, Convenience Stores, uses mapping and graph theory to look at how you can use allocate resources using um, mathematical equations to work out the closest access point to resources and work out where you should place shops. Uh, if you're a high school teacher that teaches networking, LAN party is pretty cool, teaches the kids subnet masks. So there's a whole range from really simple to uh, top of year 10 unplugged activities that you can work through with students. So we did that for a few weeks. We've just published these compendiums, which have all of the activities in one large PDF that you might want to download and just sort of drop a few copies in the staff room maybe um, and have a look at those. So the other big thing we've been doing, Lego Masters must have finished, my kids have appeared, um, is Scratch. So we have uh, started supporting Scratch within the Grok Learning platform. So this is a little project that I made today. The theme was um, an art-based project and it's just a fun little game which uses the pen. Um, you can change colors and change shapes and do all sorts of fun things, change the background. Um, I love my job, that was what I did all day. But if we jump across to Grok, if you've used our courses before, there 
online learn to code courses where you receive instructions, you follow steps, and you get feedback on your code. And we've just started to put Scratch into this platform. Please check it out if you haven't seen them yet. Um, so this is a sample slide for you. The instructions are saying, can you find the code to make certain things happen? I've just realized this is one towards the end of the course where we've taught the kids how to make games, how to use a number of the blocks. And this is a co um, some code explaining different features of game design and asks them to explore it and change things. Earlier on in the course, we have much more sort of step-by-step -step instruction. So here's a project that we have where students are building a little calculator to work out for the birthday party how many bags of freckles they'll need to buy so that everyone can get a standard serving from the packet. Uh, we've got three of these courses that are out about three hours worth of scratch for you to teach with primary kids. Um, as I mentioned, all of the courses at the moment are free access. So if I go back out, if you're not familiar with this interface on Grok Learning, um, it's pretty powerful and even more so at the moment. Some of the features you can see, you have a teacher dashboard here and the view live feature was mentioned before. That's when you can actually see in real time what your students are doing and working on. And this is empty at the moment because all of my colleagues are at home. Um, but you will see this populate with stars and asterisks and feedback on what your students are doing in real time. If that's if you don't want to be hovering in the background watching your students do their work, uh, there's also a dashboard which shows a static version of everybody's progress. And you can have a look. I'll pop in here. Um, and you get this interface for every single student showing you how far through the courses they are, what they've done. If it's orange, they're struggling, you can go and pick them up and chat to them about where they might need some help. Uh, so the other thing I wanted to mention briefly before my time is up, back on the ACA website, uh, we're running a lot of free webinars at the moment. We did one this afternoon and I can see some names in the YouTube chat tonight were with us this afternoon as well. Um, but they're covering curriculum concepts. So if you're teaching digital technologies, these are one hour free webinars where you can jump in and hear from some of the curriculum experts about the nuts and bolts right across primary and secondary of teaching this subject to students. I'm just gonna check what else I had on my list. This is a quick tour of what we've been working on. Um, webinars, scratch courses. Oh, the other thing that's happened today, it's even hard for me to keep up with it. On the Grok side of things, um, some of you may know we have a live tutoring system where if I'm working my way through a course, let me have a look. I can jump in here. Um, if I'm a student and I'm working through a course and I get stuck, I can ask for help from a tutor. And that's something we've switched on in response to COVID. We can come up here and I can send messages to the tutor. They will see exactly what I'm working on. I can ask for help. Now that's pretty cool in itself, but as of today, we've switched it on so that you as teachers can actually become the tutor and step into that interface and directly tutor your students if you're not in the same place and your students are getting stuck. That was the last thing I wanted to mention. So with that in mind, um, our team's super approachable. I'll share up here. These are my details. You can catch me on Twitter, Nicola O underscore B or the rest of the team at Oz Comp Academy. Um, come and say hi and ask us any questions you might have. And with that, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. The, the you alarm. So you just made it. Nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll throw questions to you as they come through if they do. Yep. And Josh, as you know, my lame joke is same are, same are, but different. <laughs> Josh is, um, just to forewarn you, Josh, there's much discussion in the comments about same are being a, a, a loop, a system, a cycle. So, you know, I don't want to pre presuppose what you're going to say, but that's the discussion that you're up to. So yeah, jumping. great. Uh, I, and again, I'll, I'll preface while I'm sharing my screen that it's, it's really on the person who uses it. I think and going back to our, going back to our other conversation um, or the other uh, just about, it's really how you use it and how you interpret, it, I think, which is really important. Um, 
but I'll just quickly go over here. Um, look, I, I like Xamarin, and, and I'll go through what it is. It's just basically a framework for integrating Digitech into your, into your program. Um, if you don't know who I am, I'm Josh, um, and I'm at Malvern Valley Primary School. I'm an English learning specialist and a 5-6 teacher, and you can find me at Mr. V Laminates. Um, and I'm going to attempt to do a two-minute presentation, which is likely not going to go well, but I will do my best. Um, Samra is a, is a model that... Yes? Sorry to interrupt your flow. We can't see your screen at the moment. Oh. So we okay. might want to just do a sand screen. Sorry to interrupt your flow. That's all right. Can you see it now? It says it's sharing. No, I've got a flashing screen, as does the stream. Don't know why. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Let me stop sharing, and then I will try again. Sorry. See it now or no? No, well, sadly that's great. Not. Well, I'll, I'll talk about it. It doesn't really matter. I can talk through it. If, um, what I'll do is I'll just share the slides a little bit later if you want. There's only a few slides, but um, basically SAMR means it, it's an acronym for four things, and, and it starts with how you use technology. So are you substituting uh, using apps? Are you augmenting? Augmentating? Augmenting? Are you using are you augmentation? I don't even know how to say that word. Um, substitution, augmentation, modification, or redefinition. Um, and really, you, you aim to kind of be at the top part, which redefinition and modification. Um, and yeah, there is a lot of, um, I guess, controversy to lots of frameworks. But it's a, for me, it's just a bit of an easier way to kind of see how am I using it. The only funny slide that I did have here was what does what do all these mean? Um, and you know, living in Melbourne, it was it was relating to coffees. But um, when you're substituting, you're basically just there's no change at all. Uh, whatever you can do on pencil or pen and paper, you can, you're probably using an app for that. When you go to augmentation, um, tech acts as a, as a substitute, but with some sort of improvement. So if you're looking at substitution as a cup of coffee, you might look at augmentation as a, as a latte, although I, I would 100% agree that all of Mel Melbourne would disagree with that because they would think that's the best. Um, if you go to modification, um, tech allows for a significant task redesign. Um, and that might be what some people like as a caramel macchiato. So we're kind of changing it a little bit. And if you're in redefinition, um, tech allows for creation of new tasks that were previously inconceivable and just means that you, you would not be able to do that unless you had tech with you. Um, now, uh, in my slides, you know, th there's tons of apps out there and uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll hear a lot and it's easy to get overwhelmed. Um, and it's not so much about the app that you're using, but it's really how you're using it that's gonna make the biggest difference. And there are gonna be times that you're probably gonna substitute and that's okay. And there's gonna be times that you're just gonna um, augment or modify or, uh, and then you might start moving to the redefinition. Um, and a lot of people who are going to remote learning may have started just by substituting a lot of things and that's perfectly fine, getting used to the technology and, and so forth. But um, it is important that once you get back into the swing of things that you're trying your best to aim up to that redefinition and trying to get kids um, to really transform the learning to things that they probably wouldn't have thought that they could do before. Um, I'll just give you an example of one that could be used. Um, and I'll say that since you can't really see my slides, if you just Google search SAMR, there's tons of tons of models um, and there's tons of, um, you know, classifications of apps and things like that. But again, um, the app itself isn't, uh, you know, super important. It's more, it's more of how you're planning on using it. So, for example, uh, five six, we're doing information text. If I was going to substitute um, my report, all I would do is um, create a report on a word processing app like Google Doc or Word, and they're basically just substituting the workbook for a doc uh, and a book for internet research. Um, if I was, if I was uh, augmenting, or if I was going to, if it was augmented, I would basically um, create your report on a doc or a doc X, share it with your teacher and your teacher can leave uh, digital comments for feedback. So that would be a way to augment your, um, your work. If you're moving over to modification, now you can start to do other things. So for example, if you're on docs and you're writing it and you're doing your research on the internet and you have your teacher for feedback, you can actually also share that document for peer to peer feedback. Um, yes, you could probably do it in the class as well, but the comments and interaction beside, um, going back and forth is a way that you modify that task. And then if you go to redefinition, um, there's a way to transform the learning a little bit more. Um, so for example, 
you could use Google um, Meet to get a video call with an expert to start learning about your doing your research instead of just getting your research from the internet. You could do a virtual tour if you're looking at going to different places and, and really seeing what you can without actually you know, flying to that place. And then you can have kids collaborate simultaneously and create a hyperdoc with multimedia elements, you know, publish a Google site to a, to a different audience, to a higher audience. Um, or you can create an iMovie or, or a documentary on that information text. So making that documentary and, and all the learning that comes with the with iMovie and things like that and creating a Google site that you can present to the community um, really adds that extra element um, for you of how, you know, where, where, how you're leveraging digital tech to, to really transform the learning of, of your students. So, um, I, don't, I think like lots of frameworks, nothing's really perfect, but if you start to do a bit of a self-assessment for yourself and start saying, well, where am I actually, am I in substitution or am I, am I just you know, giving worksheets on a Google Doc or just giving them a PDF to view uh, and, and I'm using tech, you're probably at the substitution quite a bit and that's okay here and there, but you probably wanna mix it up and try to think, well, where, how can I lead them to get higher to start to redefine and create a task that they wouldn't be able to do without tech? Um, and that's it. Thanks good, everybody. Good. I really enjoyed the slides that I couldn't see myself. Hey, look, they were great. I don't know if you've heard of, I don't know if you've seen Slide Carnival, but a colleague of mine told me about Slides Carnival and there are so many great looking slides there that um, make you look like a bit of a pro. Um, but yeah, um, I wish I could have showed you that, but unfortunately I could not. Yeah, okay, all good. Uh, we're gonna what throw did you see? Did you, did you see a video of me or did you see a talking uh, Just bubble? a blinking, blinking icon. I was Wonderful. Hey, you know what? That's that's probably better for the viewers. <laughs> All right, we're going to throw to Matt, who uh, who's going to talk about my Lord and Savior, um, the YouTube algorithm. <laughs> yeah. So, g'day everybody. Um, I'm Matt Fifield. I'm a researcher at Monash Uni, just at the back end of my PhD, looking at YouTube. So, if you want to talk YouTube. Um, I'll talk your head off about it. Uh, now, I'm going to share my screen also so you can say bye-bye to my pretty little face here. And we're going to go over to and hope we cross our fingers. How are we going there? Oh, we're, we're good. We're good. Yes. We're good. Um, so the machine is watching. The machine's doing all sorts of things. And I'm going to rip through as fast as I can to give you a bit of a back-end view of what YouTube's doing. Um, Got all my dates down here if you want to hit me up later. Um, what the algorithms are doing in the background. We all use YouTube, so hands up who's used YouTube before. Yep, that's everybody. Um, and what's running YouTube are two main algorithms. So there is a recommender algorithm and a search algorithm. Now, we all interact with them all the time. The recommender algorithm is the thing that says what's up next, um, drives most uh, views on YouTube, and the search algorithm, you punch in your little cat videos and it's what returns the, the list of uh, candidate videos. So these are some of the most sophisticated industrial recommendation systems in existence. Um, there are over 4 billion videos. 4% uh, of those are tagged as educational, but we as teachers know that we use a lot of stuff that's not tagged as educational, news videos and all sorts of other things, and maybe even those cat videos. My research so far shows that around about 87% of instructional videos shown by teachers in classrooms are sourced from the great Google-owned repository in the sky. So we are using it whether we admit to it or not. Some of the teachers that I speak to say, no, 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 I use other platforms. And then when we interrogate their actual um, practice, YouTube comes back time and time again. It is not a beast, it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing, um, but we need to understand what's going down. So um, this very complicated little slide here um, shows you what we talk about as human software entanglement. Um, so you've got the little guy down the bottom right hand corner here. Now, can you see my cursor or not? Do you get, yeah, yeah we got that. Beautiful. So you've got a little student down here. Uh, he's watching something, but we've also got you, the teacher. Um, you're, you're clearly searching for things on, on YouTube. Uh, we've got the producer, um, uh, Mr. Colber over there producing all these wonderful videos. And of course, we've got um, the programmer. Now, the programmer inputs the values and the goals of the system, but the algorithm is an AI system and it um, 
it pumps out the the outcome of that. Now that's that's actually led to some pretty embarrassing things. So what um, what we're going to do is go through each one of these actors and say what what's their input and what's the algorithm doing to them. I'm going to do this as fast as I can. So the programmer, um, YouTube, the, the programmers at YouTube have uh, input two main things that they want the algorithm to achieve. Number one is session length and watch time. Session length um, is the time you log on to YouTube to the time you log off YouTube. And that is the thing it's trying to optimize. It does not care how many views. Um, a video's got, it cares how many minutes a, a, a video has captured your attention. Now, as a teacher, that should already be sparking your mind, hang on a minute, we don't want them to watch for longer, we want them to be more efficient. Well, that is not what the algorithm is trying to achieve. The second thing, of course, is advertiser synergy. Uh, YouTube is paid for by advertisers, and it is um, that they're trying to, to uh, to serve. Um, the second thing, so uh, the producer. Producers on YouTube who make money out of it, they've got to serve the algorithmic master or be punished with obscurity. Now, this guy here, you may or may not know him. His name is Derek Muller. Uh, he got his PhD in video design um, for physics. Now, he now runs a very profitable YouTube channel called Veritasium, and he said this. Um, I've got to serve a double bottom line where I don't get paid. My living does not come from people learning necessarily. It also comes from people watching my videos. Now, that's a really important thing. He breaks the very rules that he his studies found. He actually found that liking doesn't necessarily um, tally up with learning. And so he says that we actually sometimes learn from videos that challenge our misconceptions, which is, which is a, something that we don't like watching. He sometimes breaks his own rules because he knows he gets paid when people watch rather than when they learn. Right, so you as the teacher. Without these algorithms, your task would be impossible. So they are your friend. When you're searching through 4 billion videos, the good thing is that an algorithm will reduce the clickbait you see. Believe it or not, there's lots of clickbait on YouTube, if you hadn't noticed. And if you just wrote mm, Battle of Hastings, somebody could tag any video with Battle of Hastings and what the algorithm does is check, oh, do the subtitles of that video actually match the description? If they don't, it'll mark it as clickbait and you won't get it. So it reduces that. It sorts the 4 billion videos for you. But some of the suspect things that algorithm does it actually has been found to preference controversy. And it also preferences watch time over educational efficiency, not to mention some of the really dodgy things that it's been found to preference, um, which I won't go into um, too much here. But that first one, preference and controversy, is really important for teachers who might teach things like history, politics, uh, English, where you're dealing with some of these really important matters. So. Um, for example, if you write uh, Islam Australia, the top ranked uh, search uh, return will be an anti-Islam video, even though a pro-Islam video has more views. Um, because YouTube knows that session length is generally extended with controversy rather than with accuracy. Well, when I said they know, the algorithm finds that people watch for longer when controversial things are served up. Um, I found that with my own videos, I kind of played around with titles and such. I got such a kick that I got half a million views for one of my videos because I played with the controversy on it. Um, now, that was just me playing with the algorithm for fun and for research, but had I monetized that video, it would have been quite the decent earner. Um, I didn't go down that path. So what do we do with this? This is what a student sees. Uh, can someone tell me how many minutes I've got left? I just don't want to run over. Uh, I'm okay. Yeah, one minute. One minute. Beautiful. So uh, the students here, this is what they see. And as you can see on the right, um, the algorithm will serve up what they love most in the world. And on the left, what you're trying to serve them up is something that they might not care too much about. So what do we do about this? As best as you can, take the video away from the YouTube platform. This is exactly the same video embedded in a learning management system. As much as you can, embedding a video, a YouTube video, in a separate site will strip away the distracting 
nature of the algorithm serving up everything that the the student loves most in the world, which will probably be not Anglo-Saxon society. Once again, there is that what we call the human software entanglement. That's a cool theory if you want to learn more about it. Here is where I got that theoretical construct of the intertwining of the human systems. So all those four actors that you were saying there and that AI system, which is kind of sitting at the heart of everything that happens on YouTube. Back to you, Mr. Colbert. All righty, thank you very much. Um, very, that was impressive, the amount of ground you covered in such a short <laughs> Nice work. Maybe maybe post your half a million view video in, in the bottom and we'll see if we can't get you a couple more cents. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 there's no, uh, I don't monetize any of those videos, so oh. you're not doing me any favor. Just kidding. All righty, <laughs> um, Stephen Payne coming to us from... Wherever the hell he's coming to us from, Stephen, where are you, mate? Talk to me. I am um, right now. I am in Perth. Thought so. Go for it. Representing. <laughs> That's it. Um, I'm just going to talk for a, a few minutes, and I just prepared a slide which I'm going to hold up. There you go. A standout Ed on Twitter. If you want to say hello. I'm going to talk uh, briefly about social and emotional learning and just a few um, a few ways that people have been using technology to promote and build social and emotional skills in, um, in their students. Um, so what do I mean by social and emotional learning? It's really the, the skills that um, help students to uh, build resilience, uh, manage their emotion, behavior, relationships with others and um, make responsible decisions but all of those um, all of those things that they need to uh, live a good life um, and I think it's really important um, particularly with the the recent um, learning from home and remote learning that that we uh, think about this because I know from things that have happened in the past I'm much much more likely to remember how I felt and how I um, responded emotionally to things than actually what tech I was using or, or um, even what topics I was learning at school. I think about the, the conversations with friends and family and how I felt. Um, and also social and emotional learning really sets the uh, foundation for good academic learning. Uh, I'll share some uh, notes on, on Twitter after this session, but I, I've read recently that um, social and emotional skills are two times more likely to predict academic success than um, home environment and demographics. So getting those foundations and those social and emotional skills um, correct is, is really important. The other thing is um, students are bombarded with feedback, whether it's peer feedback or feedback from um, teachers. Uh, on, on their learning, um, but 70% of students have said they've never had feedback on their social and emotional development. So that's just something to consider as well. So I'm just going to tell you four simple ways um, that you can use technology. Here we go. So number one, Flipgrid has been mentioned a lot. And I just think it's such a great tool for um, getting quick feedback from students. And the, the topics you can use for a start can be um, big questions that students can grapple with, like how are you going to make a difference in, in the school or in your community? Uh, but even going wider than that and linking to the social and development goals that we talked about earlier, um, thinking about how you feel and um, just giving a prompt and asking students for their immediate response. But I also think the practice of Flipgrid is really good because students get to learn about um, Watching what other people are saying and giving honest feedback and um, learning those debating skills and to respect the views and perspective of others, I think, is, is a really great way to do that within um, Flipgrid. But um, certainly with older students, perhaps they don't um, uh, want to video themselves too much. They're a bit shy or um, something like that. And you see some really imaginative ways using puppets or um, uploading images and stickers. You've now got a built-in chalkboard to diagram something. So I think Flipgrid's a, a really um, flexible way. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about forms. Um, 
I, I do quite a lot of work with Microsoft, so I'm going to mention Microsoft Forms, but I'm sure you can do the same in Google Forms and other flavors of forms. Um, really great for students that perhaps don't want to give that in-person feedback or uh, share how they're feeling on video. Um, I've seen quite a few teachers who just set up a really simple form and students respond with a how they're feeling or um, on a scale of one to five, how was your day yesterday? Really quick way for um, teachers to collect and collate that information and see if there are any students that they need to go and have a chat with. Um, the third one I'm going to mention is Minecraft. Uh, and if you actually search for Minecraft education, social and emotional learning, uh, the Minecraft team have actually built uh, a whole kit of activities that you can um, work with students. Uh, one of my favorites is called the Mindful Night. That's night with a K. Uh, the Mindful Night, the students work through a series of quests in a medieval uh, world and they practice mindfulness and self-awareness and management of their behavior and emotions in a really uh, controlled way. I think it's a great tool for um, teaching Minecraft uh, for teachers that want to get into Minecraft, but also teaching those social and emotional skills and mindfulness as well. Um, I worked at the end of last year with um, uh, an organization in Adelaide called Growing With Gratitude, and we worked with a primary school who built a theme park um, to promote service, kindness, and thankfulness. So there were some really great ideas in there, like um, some students built the whole process of getting pumpkins from a farm to a shop to the plate, and um, and just about being thankful for all the people involved in that that process that go to helping a um, a community, and then finally um, teams. So teams is something I've um, I've been working with a lot of schools in WA recently, um, and um, with students that struggle face to face, they found it much easier to to do that in teams. I've heard lots of stories of students who perhaps have been non-attenders or uh, have low attendance um, at school, but have really come into their own in sharing in teams and have kind of taken on a leadership because uh, leadership role because they they um, are much more comfortable in that technology social media environment, and it's a a, a great way to do that in a safe and controlled um, way with with a teacher monitoring it. The other thing I really love is giving that praise within Teams. Um, if you use Teams, or I'm sure you can do it in you can do it face to face, or or even with a, a postcard. But just saying thank you to people if someone's helped you, or if someone's shown great leadership, or they've done something kind. Um, you can send a, a uh, a message in Teams, but you can also do that in the old-fashioned way with a, a postcard or just a uh, just a wave and a smile. Um, so those are just a few quick ways that I think um, that you can use technology to help promote uh, social and emotional learning um, with technology. Thanks, everyone. Beautiful. Nicely done. Perth represent, as you say. Um, we're going to throw straight to Lee because I can see it's now 930 and uh, my bedtime is well past. Uh, so, Lee, over to you. Yes, mine too. I had to put uh, a couple of kids to sleep before this. So, yeah, we'll get through it. Uh, I'm coming to you from Port Macquarie, so the other side of Australia. Now, when there was a bit of chat about this, that uh, I thought I'd do some little props. So I've put this infographic. It's in the, um, in the chat on Twitter. We're looking at the age of the virtual field trip. I don't know about you, but um, I've had many, many disappointed geography students in the past few weeks. We had so many great plans. We're going here, we're going there, and all that's changed. And that's changed because, of course, um, yeah, we know what it's changed by. But I want to talk to you about some of the tools and, um, I guess, strategies that we can use to, like I've said, get out of the classroom without going out. Now, when uh, we think about this, we think back, I think back to my, t um, my schooling. Edu education is, is great, but I think more about those, those field trips, those excursions and all the different things. So while I chat to you about this, maybe put in the YouTube comments what was your best excursion you went on at school because um, I'm sure there'll be lots of memories that are flooding back. And while we're doing that, speaking of props, I brought another one. <sighs> I've got the world in my hands. So do you ever remember doing this where you spin the globe and put, put your finger on somewhere? I just landed in Salvador in Brazil. Well, with Google Maps, Google Earth and the like, we can do that, but in digital form. Now I want to talk to you about 
or Google related tools that we can use as part of virtual field trips. So in this, if you're following along, we need to really think about why we're doing it, of course. And when you're filling out a risk assessment or an excursion application form for a your normal type of excursion, you have to, you have to persuade the, the powers that be to let you out, to spend the money. So think about why you're going out. Think about what do you want your students to learn? What do you want them to experience? Because that needs to be the same for virtual field trips as well. The second one, choose a digital tool that best suits your needs. You can see I've given you a very quick overview of four Google tools, which are similar yet different. Which had a look at Tour Creator. Zena talked about Tour Creator, which is an awesome VR tour builder that you and your students, whether they're in primary or secondary, can use to create immersive tours. Now, immersion, like we heard from Zena, builds empathy. And uh, when we're talking about experiential learning, uh, Tour Creator is awesome. It harnesses the power of Google Street View. And like I did with this spinning thing, there's lots and lots of places around the globe in um, that have been mapped or um, photographed using Street View. And you can drop your students into many parts of the world. In that, you can embed content, uh, links, photos. But what's also really power in Tour Creator is the audio. You can embed audio so you can have a little commentary. You could have questions that you're asking of students similar to what you would have when you're out in the real world. Um, the next one's expeditions. What's cool about expeditions is that if you're at that stage, you're thinking, look, I've run out of time. I don't have enough time to go and create my own tours. Well, expeditions is awesome because there's so many there on tap, ready to go, VR and also AR. But like a, like a normal expedition, you can guide your students through it. So have a look at that if you want a, an immersive experience, something that's already there. Google Earth, um, many of you have probably used Google Earth before. Like I said, I'm a geography teacher. I don't know if I said that, but I, I'm a geography teacher. So Google Earth is on that list of my top go-tos. Recently in the past few months, Google Earth added a really simple feature for creating your own tours. Uh, it's and like I've said here, it's slick. It, you can create these tours that come together really quite well. You can use Street View. You can go anywhere in the world. So today I was looking at urban settlement patterns with my E10s, and we went on a virtual tour of Shenzhen in China. We went to um, London. We went to Kempsey, where I where I work, and we we looked at the differences and similarities. So Google Earth um, projects is uh, is a great one. Um, to start off with uh, with that. And you might be thinking, look, I'm not a geography teacher, so what's this got to do with me? You might be an English teacher. You might be talking about how the landscape influences writing. You might, be, uh, you might go on a tour of some rainforests and talk about what you can see. Uh, maybe think about those different senses that, well, you can't smell what's here, but what do you think you might be able to smell? And then express that through through the written word. Okay, last one. And um, you guys can ask me any questions if you want through, through Twitter on this. But for geography teachers out there, My Maps is an awesome one. It's part of the Google Drive suite. And it's you can take it to the next level. You can add in these different layers of data and information. But again, it's all place-based. And it's an example of what we call spatial technology. So things occur in places, and uh, my maps is a great one for maybe uh, if you want to take it to the next level, but also getting your kids to have a play around with it. And what I just said that that word play is all part of this. I think everyone can attest that play is so powerful. Um, the power of play and just giving your your kids uh, a little bit of time to play around with some of these tools that we've mentioned tonight because I don't know about you, but the only way that I've learned about each of these is going, hmm, I wonder what that does. Oh, that doesn't work. That does work. And have a play. Um, so that's about it for for me in terms of uh, going over what I'm going to talk about. But, yeah, have a play with each of these icons. Like I said, they're all part of the Google family um, and they are awesome because they can really extend our classrooms. We can go to anywhere in the world and experience what it's like. So we might go to 
well, middle of the Pacific Ocean. Who knows? So thanks for that. And um, yeah, if you've got any questions, just uh, ask on Twitter. But let's have a look at the, the comments in uh, in faith on sorry in YouTube. So South Coast New South Wales for five days, staying in cabins. So much fun to be had in cabins. Uh, and a lot of it's not maybe not learning, but I still remember um, when I went to Jindabyne on a geography field trip, we got the toilet paper and we threw it onto the fans and then we turned the fans on. Lots of fun. <laughs> nice work. Everyone's just incriminating themselves. Thanks for that. Um, let's throw to Joshua Simpson, who's going to tell us how a little bit of PE, a little bit of games remotely, which sounds sounds like a challenge to me. So, oh, there we go. Awesome. Um, thanks, Steve. I'm Josh. I'm from South East Melbourne. Um, and first, I want to thank you for putting this on tonight and getting me on and getting involved. Um, and thank you to everyone that shared. I'm my passion isn't around uh, Digitech, but I've certainly learned a heap from everyone that's been willing to share tonight. So thank you for that. Um, my passion lies in health and um, physical activity. That's why I'm a PE teacher. Um, and my personal pedagogy probably really lies around connection and building that relationship both with students and getting students to build relationships with each other. Um, so a bit of background onto why I'm sharing what I'm sharing is at our school, as we move to online learning um, and, and teaching, the kids were jumping onto their online conferences with their teachers and were being quite shy and, and quite in their shells. Um, so I took it on personally to try and develop a few games to get the kids interacting with each other, which I think is obviously really important and something they're missing um, from not being at school. So. I'm just going to share a few games with you guys tonight that when you have an online conference um, with your kids, you'll be able to share and, and get the kids laughing and having fun with each other um, before um, starting your online conference. So can we all see my screen there? Uh, hopefully that, that's sharing. Excellent. So these are just a few games that um, you can play at home. It's going to get the, the kids active. Um, and it's going to get them having fun with each other. So the first one is just a rock, paper, scissors based game, which the teacher is going to go rock, paper, scissors, go, and on go the kids will play rock, paper, scissors as per usual. Um, but if the students uh, don't win or if it's a draw with the teacher, the kids have to jump up and do 10 star jumps, um, just a way to get them out of their seat and moving. The next one is a fruit salad game, which is a, a classic at our school. The kids love playing. So the way this game works, um, is you give the kids three fruits to choose from. So they might be an apple, banana, a pear, for example. Uh, and then the teacher will simply say apples. All the kids that are apples have to jog on the spot for 10 seconds and count out loud. Uh, while the kids who were the fruits that you didn't say, they have to do 10 star jumps on the spot, again, just to get them up and active, which I think can be quite a challenge, especially in this time at the moment. Um, the next one's called coin flip. So... The kids can choose what exercises they want to do or you might tell them what to do, but simply the teacher flips a coin. Uh, if it lands on heads, it might mean 10 star jumps. If it lands on tails, it might mean 10 push-ups. Or once again, let the kids choose, give them a bit of um, voice and let them choose what activity they would like to do. Uh, the last one here for the physical activity side um, is quite a fun one. So it's called three, two, one. And the way it works is everyone starts with their hands on their shoulders, including the teacher. Uh, and the teacher will count down three, two, one. And on one, the kids and the teacher have three decisions to make. So they might decide to leave their hands on their shoulders. They might move their hands to their ears or their hands to their head. And if they do the same one as the teacher, then they need to do 10 star jumps on the spot. Uh, the game can keep going while they're doing the star jumps. As soon as the kids finish, they can just jump straight back in. Uh, so they're just a few ways to get the kids active um, prior to your online conferencing and then a few to build connections. So this is all about having a laugh with the kids, letting them have that interpersonal um, connection with each other. Uh, so this one's called Oink or Snort, uh, this first one here. So you need to have the mic on and the teacher starts and the whole purpose is to make an oink or a pig sound. Um, and then if the students laugh, the teacher gets a point. If they don't, then the kids get a point if they don't laugh. Um, and after the teacher's turn, they'll turn their mic off, pass it on to the next student, and then they'll get a turn, which is a game that's going to get people out of their shell 
Um, and kids will obviously have to be brave to give it a go. But you may have students that don't want to give it a go, which is fine. They can just play along and hopefully have a laugh anyway. Uh, the next one here is called Teacher Says. So it's another simple game just based off Simon Says, really. Um, but I encourage you to use your name to make it more engaging for the students within your class. Um, so if it was me, I would say Mr Simpson Says, hands on your head. Um, and if the kids get it wrong, they just need to do 10 star jumps and, again, join straight back in. Um, make Me Laugh is pretty similar to Snort that I referred to earlier. Uh, pretty much the teacher starts and they're unmuted while everyone else has to be muted but try and keep a straight face. Um, the teacher just chats to the kids, tells some jokes or some funny stories with the goal of making them laugh. If they can, the teacher gets a point. Um, if they don't laugh, the student gets a point and then again, give the students a turn, which is really going to be good too and getting them telling different narratives and jokes and public speaking. And then the last one here is just a bit of a dance party. Um, you might use technology and get the students to submit their favourite song via a Google form or something like that. But the whole purpose of this one is to, again to get the kids active, um, do some dance moves. They might make up a move and the rest of the class has to copy them. Um, or a really fun way as well is if your students play a musical instrument, get them to um, play an instrument prior to your Google conference. Um, obviously, again, they've got to be brave to give it a go, but that's just another way to build those relationships with the students. Um, so I'm happy to I'll close that. Um, I'm happy to share that document on Twitter, and obviously you can use that with your classes. Um, it's not quite the digitech that everyone else has been sharing, which I've really appreciated and learned heaps from, uh, but hopefully you can use that in your own uh, live Google Meets or conferences and it can help your students connect in this time where connection is obviously quite challenging. So thank you. Beautiful, Josh. That's great. I'm genuinely going to try those tomorrow morning. I've been running out of, you know, which would you rather and, you know, all those kind of questions to get the kids sort of turning up and logging in and, you know, doing all those sort of things. If you could only eat this for the rest of your life, you know, but that's, this sounds a lot more physical and a lot more active. So I'm, I'll be downloading it right now and then uh, emailing it to myself for tomorrow morning. I love it. Thank Enjoy. you. Uh, Scott is going to talk to us about 3D shapes, ways to use them and show them in the classroom. So heading back to full on ed tech, Scott. Oh, Scott, cannot hear a Scott. I can see a Scott, but I cannot hear a Scott. Uh, should be. Yeah, good. Gotcha. Can you hear me now? Hear me now? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so I've come from, um, like, for six years, I was in a normal school. So now I've moved into a, um, uh, like, last year, a, a different context where we have excursions coming in. So it's a math science specialty center and i'd never done much with 3d before and we've we do a bit of that with our one of our programs and more recently as part of our response to um you know covid 19 and stuff is to develop a synchronous program using tinkercad and one of the things i it, it sort of i took i've taken away from this is how i could use this in say a math classroom so i'm going to make a quick Quick steps, uh, if this actually works quicker. Oh, I'm just going to have to use this one now. Um, and it's not working. Oh, here we are. So the reason I found this was quite useful, and it, there's other ways you can do it. I've, I've met some teachers, I've talked to teachers where they've done it. So basically, you can get like a cube, for example, make it into a um, thing. So we, we, we actually talk about using this as a, like a tissue box. Um, when we when we're teaching the kids, so we actually teach them. So I've put a work plane down, work plane down, so I can actually get my shape onto here. And the way I'm using this is, is more in a in a mass context, because if I make this um, into a hole, and so so I'm I'm going through this fairly quickly. I can um, I can actually drop it down into the shape. Now where this can be useful is I can start to see dimensions where. <clears throat> You know how far how far I'm sinking it in. That's like that minus twelve on the side. But if I actually change the work plan I'm working from, I can actually you know five um, mils off the off the bottom. I could put a work plane. Oops, I'll let you go onto the side. I can put a work plane on the side. Same sort of thing here. And now I can 
if I'm going to um, move it across, uh, some, I'm not the best at thinking cat, by the way. Um, so I've got to pull that one. I can oh, start to see how close I am. Yep. You can see. Can't see it? No. Ah. All right. Oh, that's because I'm not sharing. Oops. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> I will quickly share. I, I thought I'd shared it, but I'd forgotten that part. Sorry about that. Can you see it now? Sure can, yeah. Go. I have my doubt on that one. Um, so basically, basically what I've been showing here is how you can sort of start to look at some dimensions and uh, measurements sort of stuff in, say, mass, for example. Um, so like, oh, I'll go back to what I was showing before just so you can actually see it. So my bad on that one. If I actually move up and down, that part there is telling me how far away I am from that surface. But if I put a, a work plane on different different sides, I can start to get dimensions and students can start, start to look, look at um, what their you know, some of the mathematics of dimensions and, you know, you start to use, um, you know, stuff they've learnt in, you know, measurement. I mean, I'm from secondary, so it's more like that, you're sort of year seven and eight. But, you know, in the end, they can also, in the end, have a tissue box that they might use. Um, now, one of the things I've saw more recently was I was talking to a teacher and about what one of his students had done. It's not just maths and even science. Um, this student had seen a story in English and actually had transformed a scene from what they've seen in English into, into TuneCAD and made it. So it's becoming, been able to sort of make that sort of visual look into a more of a 3D um, perspective. It's something I hadn't thought about in terms of other um, areas. Um, and that sort of brought me about, you know, how we use 3D shapes. Um, can you see the PowerPoint? Because um, I've gone onto a PowerPoint here. Yep, okay. And, yep, cool. Um, and often we, we say we, we're doing this. Well, you might want to visualize it. All right, looks like we've lost sound again. So what we're going to do is open 3D. And I'm going to pretend uh, we cannot hear you, Scott, but we can see what you're sharing. All right, who knows? Who knows how to use 3D images in PowerPoint? No, but I can admit that this supports, you know, the development of visual spatial skills, <laughs> looking at things from different perspectives. It's great That's for nice. those students who don't have that developed yet. That's true. Feel free to continue talking, Zaina. This is great. And um, for those unicorn-loving students in our class, they will most likely colour it in with rainbow glitter. If you can bring out that colourful pen, that'll be great, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> you, you you could also uh, look at telling different context of a story so placing the story on the bottom of it and then placing four different contexts of a story around the outside so there are lots of different ways we can use three-dimensional shapes to support our literacy so I, I love the idea of doing this sort of stuff it's uh, right up a new new mode of kind of thinking particularly when you bring in the fact that you can place a human in the middle of that and read the story off all of the walls and the story off the floor. Mm, I love that. Yeah, we in English we often do a multiple perspective story, which is jumping off your idea there. I love it. All right, Scott's done, I believe. Um, we're going to throw to our Kiwi, Michael, if you're alive and well. Uh, yeah, let's go international. Um, so at the present in lockdown in Malaysia. So salamatatang. I'm uh, Dr. Harves, uh, Dr. Underscore Harves on Twitter, and today I'm going to well finish off with a bit of uh, zenness, bringing the humanity back into technology. Because remember, teaching is a human endeavour, so we must not forget that. So let's see if I can share my screen and have more luck than everyone else. Okay, so just an image, really. 
That's all it is. Keep it simple. So as we move through this, this process of online learning and going back into the classroom, how can we try to effectively maximize the, the learning for our learners? Um, and this is where I've actually been looking at the research of uh, the University of Queensland at the uh, Science of Learning Research Center. Um, so basically, I'm going to give you three little, little tips to try and focus on learning and make it easier for your learners uh, as they, they learn. The first one is with presentations, just keep it simple. Uh, research shows that uh, a combination of just a relevant image and just speaking around that image or, or simple text is the most effective way to get to our learners. Um, think about when you're listening to two people at once, you try and just listen to one or try and listen to both. It's just easier to just listen to one, the person that's speaking the presentation, uh, and it's easier for the kids to actually just process that information. So that's why I, I'm now trying to implementing more Zen presentations rather than just screeds of reading out what's on the screen. Um, this might be sucking eggs to some people, but I think it's important just to reinforce it, that, that simplicity is key. Uh, the second thing I'd like to just uh, focus on is the use of space uh, in presentations. So basically keep the same, in each slide, just keep the, the positions of key points in the same positions because research again says that this is most effective for our learners, it doesn't take much in terms of cognitive load. And I think the most important part is about the idea of, of storytelling. Um, we can use technology, but we must always remember that we are humans, teaching humans, and teaching is indeed a, a human endeavor. Um, so stories allow our learners to stimulate an experience. This leads to higher levels of engagement. Emotional connection, okay, so previous speakers have, have spoken about the connection that you, you get from the experience and what you feel when you're learning, and also motivates you when you're listening. The contextualized information leads to increased transfer of information. And preventing, presenting facts is a unified story. For example, uh, Newton's self-isolation during the plague in 1666 and how we developed calculus uh, allows learners to contextualize and personalize the material around the physics and actually drives them uh, forward in terms of understanding of the content. Uh, using stories from you, and your learners live as well, so incorporating what your learners' stories are, uh, increases discussion, increases engagement, and provides deeper considerations of, of the topics. So, I mean, this is just basically uh, what I was just going to say for finishing this off. Um, where is me, me here? Okay, so if you want to connect, there I am at Dr. Harves. I've been exiled for the good of the realm. Now I'm in the lane <laughs> behind borders. Um, but yeah, if you want to connect, there I am on Twitter. And it's been great listening to everyone today and uh, go forward in the next few weeks and, and be bold and be brave. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Beautifully done. Um, what I'm going to try to do is uh, we have one last presentation that if uh, judging from our performance up to, up to so far may or may not work, but we'll give it a go. This is from Matt Esterman, uh, who had a sudden prior engagement emerge. So we'll try it out. Um, ideally, someone let me know if you can hear it. Let's give that a go. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to talk through um, a core idea that we're playing with at my school. Um, it's something that I think is useful when considering the rapid changes that we're deploying and the conversations we're having about technology and how to be more inclusive with our colleagues um, and also with our students and making sure that we're providing a consistent experience from the student's point of view, whilst we're experimenting and changing with different platforms and um, different types of tools. So I'll call it growing from the core because I think there are, um, there's obviously this pathway from entry um, level engagement with technology all the way through to invention. And I'll go through that um, in a minute. But we'll have to consider a few key questions around growing out our technology platforms and our, our expectations around technology in our schools for the context. So. What are your core platforms in your school? Is there, um, you know, are there particular mandates around the use of technology? And if not, what is your department and, and across the school, what are the students experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis? Are they going to multiple different platforms? Is that confusing for them? Um, what, what are those platforms that are expected to be used? And in particular, what are supported by your school or system as well? What are backed up? What are securely um, connected to? 
what are things that you don't need your personal email, for example, to sign up to? What are those core platforms that are supported by your school um, that you can rely on to give a consistent experience? They might not be the best um, platforms out there. They, they might be more generic than you'd like, but at least they're supported and secure and something that you can rely on over time. Similar to this, what is your shared language around the technology as well? So when people say click here or when they say press here or tap here or even things as simple as that can confuse people. They can confuse people who use different types of technology. They can confuse people who use different types of platforms. So you have to make sure that when you're, for instance, giving instructions to students, that we actually have a shared language about what all that is and means so that we can move forwards quickly and easily from this idea of entry level um, experience through to invention. What are your shared expectations as well? Do you have rules around the use of technology? From operational stuff like when and how certain tools are to be used like Zoom, um, coming usually from a child protection point of view, um, or are there shared expectations around workload? So that you know, one teacher isn't allowing students to send in, say, multiple drafts of an English essay um, and do that through email, whereas another teacher is using a particular platform to streamline that in a different way um, and, and having a different set of expectations around the use of the technology. We need to have those shared expectations and consistent expectations so that we are providing a consistent experience. And so where are your colleagues on the tech journey? Do they know what the core platforms are? Do they share your language around technology or not? Do they have shared expectations of technology with you or not? Do you have to perhaps give up a little bit of your expectations if you're at a particular point in the journey to enable them to come along on the journey as well? Or do you want to maintain your level of um, expectation and support people to get to there or, or close to there or be on the journey to get there? So where are your colleagues on the tech journey? Are they at the entry level? Are they usually a bit fearful, apprehensive, unsure or sceptical about the use of technology at all to improve or enhance their teaching and learning experience? Um, have they just never had the experience before? I keep thinking of my mum who had, um, you know, 40 years experience in teaching, but most of her career, most of her training and most of her experience, therefore, did not have technology, um, you know, as embedded as we do now. So she's a great teacher, but she needed different types of support um, compared to someone perhaps who is fresh out of uni or someone who has just had a different experience to sh that, that she did. Then we go to the adoption level and the idea that some staff, and there are many staff, I would argue, um, in, in 2020 would be able to do things like the digitising of particular resources, allow for digital submission, marking perhaps, or giving feedback. Communication, surely. Um, many, many, many of us know how to use email, for example, as the, as the key communication tool, but then there are other things that are now coming out of the woodwork and being used quite more frequently. And of course, live collaboration collaboration too. I would put that under the adoption category now, where those are things that are fairly standard in most schools at the moment. Um, and But are we, allow, are we helping our colleagues to get to that level? In terms of appropriation and adaptation, how confident are our staff? Are they confident? Do they report that? How do they report that? Are they skilled in terms of being able to show others and, and demonstrate what they're doing in the classroom? Not necessarily to teach them, but just to show what they're doing, be able to explain that. Are they being creative with it? Are they adapting one the technology in a different setting and being able to show that it can be used in multiple ways? And are they talking about pedagogy at this level as well? Not just sort of, the, um, you know, sometimes frantic digitization of stuff um, to be able to send it home to students, um, but are they actually thinking about, well, what if I do um, you know, a discussion board instead of a class discussion? What might that mean for, for the progress of the students? And then of course, the level four, the invention, this is where they are actively teaching others how to do things, confidently striding into staff meetings, for example, and offering support and offering help. Um, are they strategizing? Are they saying, well, this is what we've got today and maybe in the next unit we can do this and this and this. Are they at that level of confidence? They're actually looking towards the future too. Are they discovering and evaluating and saying, well, this is the tool we've got now, but look at these other tools that are coming through that, that they might subscribe to Twitter or, or have an account in Twitter and be engaged there or, or in Facebook groups or through Instagram or um, Pinterest or other sorts of platforms. And are they experimenting? Are they trying things and failing in their classroom and sharing that experience? That's what I would say categorise it, um, characterises the invention level. So as we're thinking about using all sorts of different platforms, as we look at all the shiny things that are coming in our emails, are we focused on what are our core tools at our school that are provided by our school? And are we building a language around that, expectations around that? And are we supporting our colleagues to 
keep going on their tech journey, knowing that we're all struggling a little bit at the moment in different ways. And the best thing we can do is hold out a hand, probably not literally, and allow them to come along the journey with us. If we start with the core stuff, then we have a more consistent experience for our students. Thanks a lot. All righty, so that's Matt Esteman from New South Wales. Uh, just to wrap this up for us, uh, our next one involves these people. It will be Teach Meet 4. Uh, you can sign up at the same place you signed up for this one. Uh, or if you said you were willing to find out about forthcoming ones, uh, you'll be emailed about those in particular. And we're currently still working on, you know, what might a, uh, a Teach Meet 5 look like and what will it involve. So if anyone's got any ideas, uh, that would be lovely. And we're happy to hear from those. But on that note, uh, I'll bring it to a close. Thank you to all our presenters for presenting and giving up their time. Uh, it's always uh, incredible to see just how willing teachers are to meet up and speak with other teachers and in, in, in association with uh, all of our colleagues. So <laughs> stay well and see you all later. Thanks, Stephen.